Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. Since you can't come down to the grill room, we're going to bring the grill room to you with these online WILs. Uh, we hope you're having a good, safe time um, during this incredible COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's keeping people off of sailboats, which is a bit of a drag since uh, sailing is a kind of a natural form of social distancing. <laughs> and so um, many of us uh, miss the time on the water and of course our camaraderie with fellow members at our yacht clubs. Um, our speaker today began as a rower. In fact, a good enough rower on the Princeton lightweight team that effectively he rode in the test event in the pre-Olympics in Munich. There would not be a lightweight team on the eights that year, but uh, he was good enough to be uh, varsity and on the, on the bow of the boat, bow guy on an eight as uh, the first guy to cross the finish line, as you all recall. Uh, so that speaks to the heart of our speaker today. Um, he got into sailing late in the game in 1995. He was one of three guys who paid 10,000 bucks for an Ericsson 27 usual uh, crazy thing that is to say any buying of a boat is a crazy activity they thought they'd bang around in san francisco bay in it in 2001 he and his family uh, did a bear boat charter in the bvi which was um, a great fun family adventure in 2006 our speaker founded cup experience and um, um a terrific um thoughtful commentary on cup activities. In 2007, he ran the uh, spectator boat on Shoshalosa um, in uh, Valencia. That was, you may recall, the two-year program by a South African team, um, about a $40 million uh, taste of the America's Cup, and notable to St. Francis members because Ray Lotto had his Commodore's, Commodore Cruz that year, and he was aboard the Show Salosa, uh, Show Salosa, uh, where our speaker today was the VIP commentator. Um, he repeated that same act in 2010 in Valencia, where he was expert commentary for the VIP boat for a Lingi. Um, and you may recall, uh, those of you who are keeping track in those days, um, in the pre-start, I think it was about three minutes before the start, three or four minutes before the start, I tweeted that uh, the cup was coming to San Francisco because the Oracle boat was so much faster on the line than a Lingy that it seemed inevitable. It was an interesting start because as our speaker today will clearly recall, um, a Lingy actually got uh, Oracle up in irons and, and basically took off, went to the right end of the course with a humongous lead, but Oracle was so much faster she ultimately caught and passed a lady who was minutes ahead at one point during that leg because Oracle was just lightning fast in the light breeze. Um, in 2013, our speaker was again expert commentary, now in San Francisco Bay for the Artemis team, which was a um, powerful, good team. Our chairman of the board, Paul Kayard, was the CEO of that effort. And uh, we all remember they were uh, a strong team, uh, suffered a great loss when Bart Simpson, um, you know, uh, died uh, during one of their practice sessions, but it was a very strong team, all that a uh, very, very capable effort there. In 2017, um, our speaker today was again expert um, uh, commentary uh, for the Artemis team down in uh, Bermuda, and um, he also um, did a great, uh, um, a thoughtful gesture for lots of us who were uh, at the cup in, in that uh, effort because he persuaded the um, um, people who own uh, Eleonora to hold the America's Cup Hall of, and America's Cup Hall of Fame dinner aboard Eleonora, which was a beautiful, fun thing. And it was a beautiful event on a gorgeous classic yacht right there in, uh, in Hamilton Harbor. And, uh, you know, just a hop, skip and jump away from the, you know, uh, Royal um, Bermuda Yacht Club and a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful event. 
And so um, I'd like to welcome um, our speaker today, um, the founder of Cup Experience, uh, Jack Griffin. Jack, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon in our online version. Uh, it's terrific to have you here. Um, update us on what's going on with the Cup in New Zealand. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Ron, thanks a lot. Uh, it's great to be with the uh, Wednesday Yachting Luncheon again. I must say I liked it a lot better when I did it live in the grill room in 2014, but uh, we'll do what we can with this. So um, yeah, I've had, a, I've had a great ride. I, when I started out uh, winning boat races, I wasn't smart enough to sail. I had to do the um, strong back and a weak mind, sitting down, going backwards version, uh, rowing. But uh, I you know, fell in love with sailing, was lucky enough to get hired by the Lingi, uh, to do some work from them, and that led to Cup Experience getting started, Shoshaloza, and I just became a complete junkie about the America's Cup. And I really, really enjoy uh, explaining this stuff to people. I, uh, there's many things that I'm very mediocre at, but one of the things I'm generally pretty good at is explaining complex, complex stuff. And the America's Cup is certainly that. Uh, it depends on whether you're talking about the, the technology, the rules, the skullduggery, the legal fights. Um, very complex and very exciting and interesting to some of us, a lot of us, uh, event. So 36th America's Cup, we hope, will be happening in Auckland a little bit less than a year from now, starting on uh, March 6th, would be the, the first race of the, of the match. Um, I'm sure that everybody who's watching this probably knows that uh, the whole thing started in 1851 with a race around the Isle of Wight, won by the New York Yacht Club's yacht called America, and the uh, cup that had been offered by the Royal Yacht Squadron for that race, uh, open to all nations, uh, was originally named after its price tag. It was the 100-pound cup. and. Um, it became America's Cup after America won it. So that gives us a little clue that the America's Cup has always been about money since the trophy was originally named for its price tag. Uh, you know, a great event over the, over the years. Um, yachts used to look like this. Uh, Reliance 1903, my favorite America's Cup yacht, largest America's Cup yacht ever built. The, uh, the top mast there uh, was over 202 feet above the water, and it, that's as big as the wing was on Oracle USA 17 in 2010. So um, overall length, uh, tip of the bowsprit, end of the boom, 202 feet. And if anybody wants to say that USA uh, 17 in 2010 was bigger than Reliance, um, I guess all I would say is just remember that Reliance's keel was 102 tons of lead. Um, so, you know, just it shows the, the kind of the craziness of the America's Cup in terms of people uh, building yachts that were good for one thing and one thing only, racing for the America's Cup. Uh, this was one of the most extreme examples. We had some other very extreme examples in 2010, you know, Ron mentioned being there uh, here's a, a rare shot of a lingi ahead of USA 17, um, and certainly the, the wing sail on USA 17 was the difference. The biggest wing of any kind ever built for anything, uh, aircraft or what have you, that is the biggest wing that was ever built in the world. Uh, the one thing that Ron was, uh, you know, it's a good thing that the tweet came through that the America's Cup did go to San Francisco after the two races in this incredible grudge match in Valencia. Um, but those two races were, to my knowledge, the only times that USA 17 managed to sail 40 miles. Um, Olingi had done a couple of trial you know, goes of, you know, what does it, what is it to go out and back uh, to windward 20 miles and return? Uh, USA 17 had always had something break down. And fortunately for, um, for the, for Oracle racing on those two days, nothing broke and they uh, obviously brought the cup back to San Francisco. The craziness, you know, I live in Switzerland, the crazy, you know, we love the Alps. So here's a uh, famous Carlo Borlenghi shot of uh, Olingi 5 being transported from Lake Geneva to Genoa. 
um, on the Mediterranean. Uh, it had to, of course, be constructed in country, and it was built in Switzerland, but then how do you get a boat that big, 115 feet, probably overall length, even though it was 90 feet on the waterline, how do you get it to the Mediterranean? Well, you hire the biggest Russian transport um, helicopter and you fly it over the Alps like this. Um, that brought us, you know, after that craziness, we did come to San Francisco and we got to have the uh, 19 race uh, America's Cup of 2013 in San Francisco, just absolutely phenomenal. And um, I would guess that a lot of people listening in probably know where USA 17 is, the yacht that won in Valencia and brought uh, in Valencia and brought the cup to San Francisco. She's sitting in a pond down in Redwood Shores outside the Oracle headquarters, of course. But where is this USA 17? Where is this Oracle yacht? Um, she has found her home actually on the East Coast. She's now a, uh, a permanent exhibit in the Mariners Museum uh, in Newport News and you really want to, it, the Mariners Museum is a phenomenal museum and this exhibit is uh, just staggering. You get, up, get to be up close enough to get a, a sense of how big uh, this AC-72 was. Um, I was asked to be the guest curator for the exhibit and help organize the exhibit and got to help put USA-17 together after she was shipped in pieces with no instructions and no drawings of how to put it together. And there's a curator at the museum, uh, a woman who was small enough to crawl into the beams and so on and attach a lot of the bolts. And this is kind of a fun picture because you remember that of course Oracle was down eight points to one and it looked like the cup was going to New Zealand. And you can actually see here on the center beam, there are two circles. That's where the mass step was, the forward circle. And they actually, when they were working on the yacht, making it faster through the course of that race, they actually did the structural work to move the mast aft. They decided not to do it. They left it in its original position, but it was just, you know, obviously a staggering, crazy uh, America's Cup event with the AC-72s. So just a lot of fun to be involved with that event and a lot of fun to be involved with, uh, with this USA-17 uh, who lives now in Newport News, and I can only recommend that uh, Newport News is not the easiest place in the world to get to, but boy, if you find yourself in that part of the world, get there and see the exhibit because the, the boat is just uh, spectacular. Um, we'll come back to that museum, which I really love uh, in a moment, but moving from the AC-72s, we went to the so-called AC-50s. Actually, the official name was the uh, America's Cup class. And the Kiwis came up with their cyclers uh, to, to power it. And um, that was, these were the boats, that obviously, that raced in Bermuda. They're the boats, except for this one, which is in New Zealand, of course, but the, the AC-50s um, are now being used in Sail GP being made into one design and having some uh, additional control systems and not needing the, uh, the cycler or the grinder power for them. But uh, New Zealand, you know, you can see the, the guys that I guess you would call sailors, uh, Simon van Veltoven, the man furthest forward there at the, um, on the left in the picture was an Olympic cyclist. I uh, had never sailed before and provided some of the oomph uh, for the Kiwi boat and of course their daring and ingenuity of going with the cyclers. Uh, you can see Blair Took's name uh, on his shoulders there, the, the third guy from the left. He had, the reason he's got his head down is that he's operating a joystick that uh, allowed him to basically follow a dot around on a screen and the, the systems that they had, and I'll come back to systems again because systems are so important in these incredibly high-tech boats, but the rule did not allow computer control of the boat, but the rule did allow any kind of display. And what the Kiwis came up with was a display 
that basically had a dot moving around on an on a tablet screen, an air gap between the dot on the screen and a dot that would show up on a, a, a screen that was parallel to the main one on the tablet. And Tuke had a joystick and he would just follow the dot around uh, that the computer controls or computer, um, not controls, but, but uh, instrumentation system, let us say, would show him. And that's how he could optimally uh, tune the, uh, the board rake for increasing or decreasing the angle of attack of the foil underwater and the cant. And that was a big part of it. Glenn Ashby, you see, he's the one sitting just uh, ahead of Pete Burling, the helmsman. Ashby had a little um, Xbox style control system that he used to control the wing. And they had a phenomenal wing control system. They had more hydraulic power pressure available to them because of the efficiency of the cyclers. And uh, in the case of two, by not having to grind with his arms, he also had his hands free to, uh, to run some of the controls on the boat. So um, remember control systems because they're going to be really important um, in Auckland. And I'll show you a, a clip a little bit later of uh, why the control systems are such a big deal from one of the races uh, in Bermuda. Um, now, the Kiwis won, and everybody pretty much knew that if they won, that the challenger of record would be Luna Rosa, because rewinding the tape a little bit, the AC-50 started life as the AC-62, when after Oracle won uh, defended successfully in San Francisco in 2013. They came out with a new rule that was a little bit smaller, a 62 foot long catamaran. And after doing some tests with the test boats, Larry Ellison and Russell Coots decided that the AC 50s, where they're actually AC modified AC 45s, looked pretty good. So why do we need to build something as big as an AC 62? Let's change the rule and let's go back, let's go to a smaller boat. And the problem was that the, and here's where skullduggery comes into the America's Cup. The problem was that the protocol said that you couldn't change anything in the class rule without the unan unanimous approval of all the competitors. Luna Rosa didn't want to change the, anything in the rule. So they just said, no, 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 you don't understand. We're not changing the AC62 class rule. We're throwing it away. We're changing the protocol and we're going to a new rule because there's nothing in the protocol that prevents us from changing the rule. And tyranny of the majority, um, the other challengers, except for New Zealand, threw in with, uh, with Oracle on that, voted. Pat Patrizio Bertelli was incensed, uh, pulled out of the, uh, of, the uh, of the challengers for AC34, uh, but then gave money and technology and some of his people to Team New Zealand to help them win. And so to pay back, they had agreed that if they were to win, that Bertelli and Luna Rosa would get to be the challenger of record for this now upcoming 36th America's Cup in 2021. Um, and it was well known that um, Bertelli absolutely wanted to go back to monohulls. And in fact, when in 2013, it looked like, Lunar, uh, like New Zealand was going to win uh, in San Francisco, they were already making plans and Bertelli was going to be the challenger of record. And interestingly enough, at a St. Francis Yacht Club um, stag cruise in 2014 that I attended with Commodores of other yacht clubs who would be in position to know of what they were, what they were talking about uh, told me that Bertelli was ready to actually fund a fleet of 10 big monohulls so the teams could get used to a new monohull class. But of course, that all went down the drain when Oracle came back through, in, through the 19 races and kept the cup. Payback time came in 2017 when Team New Zealand won. Luna Rosa is now the challenger of record. So Luna Rosa 
wants their monohulls. But as they say, be careful what you wish for, because Bertelli wasn't quite specific enough in, in terms of what kind of a monohull he want. And the Kiwis came up with the AC-75, a foiling monohull, which when they first announced it, sounded completely crazy. Um, but the, 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 the bloody things actually go really fast in a straight line. We have yet to see how they do it racing, um, We'll get to see that eventually, but the, the things do that. Now, you might think that a foiling monohull is something completely new, but go back to Newport News and visit one of their other exhibits that they have there, and you will see uh, this yacht. This is a foiling monohull. This is the Monitor. Uh, it was developed by the Baker Manufacturing Company uh, as a research project for the U.S. Navy um, and uh, Monitor is, they have videos at Newport News. You can find the videos of Monitor actually sailing and maneuvering uh, on YouTube, but Monitor was a foiling monohull. Now she used these ladder um, foils and kept both of them down. The control system was a little bit less sophisticated than what we see in the <laughs> 1850s and the, uh, the AC-75s now. Uh, this is the cockpit of Monitor in the museum in Newport News. And those uh, handles that you see down below, uh, that you see below there, those actually control the, that's the, that's the foil cant system. So there's a, a slightly more sophisticated foil cant system in the um, in the AC-75, but those cranks uh, could ra would raise and lower the foils on monitor. So that's uh, nothing new under the sun. We've seen foiling monohulls before, just not. In year, what year was this? What year was monitor? I believe was 1957. I'd, I'd have to go back and check that for sure but just a phenomenal boat. And she's there to see in, uh, in Newport News, in the museum, all rigged up with uh, her sail and everything. I have other photos, but I thought the foil, the foil cant control system would be interesting to take a look at here. <laughs> so um, there, oh, there she is with the, the foil in the raised position uh, in the museum in Newport News, um, just, it's a phenomenal museum. They have lots of very cool things there to be seen. Very so there's a foiling monohull, 1957 monitor. The um, AC-75 is theoretically self-writing in case of a capsize. Only one of them has gone over so far, and that's the Kiwis. They had a very gentle, low-speed capsize. Then they got the boat standing back right side up pretty quickly. They did, it was not all by itself. They did use tow lines and, uh, and writing lines from their tenders, but they did get it back up. The uh, electronics uh, and other control systems in the yacht uh, withstood the dunking in the salt water, and she was able to go off and carry on with, uh, with her, uh, her training for the day. But um, this business of control systems, I want to show you a, a little video now and this is from race two in 2017 in Bermuda. Um, remember that Oracle uh, only won what, one race uh, and the Kiwis dominated, but in race two, it wasn't clear. The Kiwis won race one. And in race two, it looked like they were doing a horizon job on, uh, on Oracle on, the, uh, on leg five, one of the windward legs. And let's just take a look at what happened. This is actually the, um, the race. And we'll listen to Ken Reed's commentary and we'll watch. So here we are with, um, with uh, New Zealand, what are they? One, two, three, four, five, about 600 meters ahead uh, on leg five, the upland leg. So we'll just take a look at how they do with uh, on this upland leg having been about here's the keys about 600 meters ahead of Oracle. Just look at these VMG numbers again even though they're on opposite tacks they're both settled in. New Zealand is a little out of whack right now because they're on a headed side of a, of a wind shift. 
on the bad side of the windshield. So Tom Swingsby did a great job of picking the shifts on this. On this layer, I'm going to fast forward a little bit, and let's go up to getting a little closer to the windward gate. Here's our cyclers working away. And let's take it from here. Here's, so now here's Oracle crossing over, still uh, 250 meters behind. Now let's watch and see what happens. Here we are on board Oracle, obviously. There's Slingsby. He's been doing a good job calling the shifts. Is an instrument right there that is helping him tell what the wind direction is. He's looking in the water for the dark spots, and he's probably using that instrument in his hand in order to help him figure out is the true wind direction, is the wind direction working for them or against them? Okay, so here's Oracle tacking now for the gate. So they're laying the gate. Actually, BMG, BMG. They're happy to be a little fast. Right? BMG, which means they just go normal. Sometimes you say high groove because there's a puff to weather of you, which means closer to the wind. Sometimes the puff is right in front of you. You want to. So you can hear Now look at how much they've closed up. They're only about 80, 80 meters behind. Yes. Or New Zealand still has to throw in attack here. Here they go on their tack to get to the uh, to the gate. Both of them want to round the uh, the right hand mark at this gate. If there's an overlap here, they're in big trouble. Oracle will have the right away. They just barely get up on their foils on time. Barely. No overlap when they enter the zone, so there's no rights for Oracle to go inside. Oracle is just right on the stern. As they come around now, so they protest. The protest gets green flag. So green flag. Now here we go. Now here's where control systems come in. They've gained back about 600 meters. They're right on behind the Kiwis. And now watch what happens with the job. New Zealand jibes, Oracle jibes, watch Oracle's speed. But Oracle gets very slow in their jibe down to eight knots, and the Kiwis are going 18. So all of a sudden, they get back Hard to just have a bad jibe. Now, look at what's going on on this boat. Slingsby has crossed over. Now he's crossed back over to the other side. Kyle Langford is looking up at the up at the wing. That's, um, Graham Spence, is he's, he's on the handles. He's turning, he's not turning. What are they doing? The control systems just let them down there, and they had come back from 600 meters behind, and now they're 400 meters behind again. And they still are scrambling back and forth, back and forth across the trampoline because what was going on with those um, control systems? So this is a thing that know that Oracle had all the financial resources they need. They had phenomenal uh, engineering design, phenomenal sailors, and yet you get into the race and when you need to stick a jibe, they were, the systems weren't working right. They, they couldn't, uh, they certainly had enough oil pressure because they, it had been probably a minute earlier that they had tacked on the upwind, uh, on the upwind leg. They made their rounding. They did a, uh, just a, a bear away. They didn't jibe around the mark on the rounding. And then when they had to do their first jibe, the control systems let them down. So control systems will be uh, a really big deal uh, in, the, in the next America's Cup, just as they were in the last America's Cup. Now let's take a look at some things about the AC-75s and some of the uh, interesting and kind of hairy things that we have to look at for them. This is... Um, at the Mets exhibit in Amsterdam, but this is the Caraboni booth. And this is actually an AC-75 foil arm and the foil cant system. So you can see the big hydraulic rams there, uh, obviously made by Caraboni because it's on their booth. Those are connected to the, that's the inboard end of the 
foil arm. Uh, you can see the pivot point. So you can see there's a really small lever arm uh, that those rams have to work against on that pivot point for the arm. Important thing here, the arms and the control system for canting the arms are one design and they're not just one design, they are in quotation marks here, supplied equipment. What that means is that Team New Zealand built the foil cant systems for all of the teams and Luna Rosa, uh, actually Persico in Italy, uh, built the arms to a design by Luna Rosa. So for this supplied equipment, the defender and the challenger of record decided that the challenger of record would design the arms uh, and they would be built by Persico in Italy and that New Zealand would design the foil cant system and build that in New Zealand and supply it to all of the teams. Now, what could possibly go wrong with that? Well, <laughs> One thing is that if you are, if you're the one designing the foil cant system and you need to make re revisions to the system, how do you test them in a fair way so that you can test your revisions and then make them available to the other teams to whom you've supplied the foil cant system? Well, the answer is you don't, you get to test it ahead of them. And so you get to see what's going on with any changes to the foil cant system. Little detail in the rules, the foil cant system has to be frozen in August of this year. After August, New Zealand can't make any more changes to it. Now there's another thing that could possibly go wrong and uh, we'll see a, a video of that. So in September, 2018, they did the first uh, test to destruction of a foil arm and um, there's a complication even now, which is where is this happening? Bergamo, Italy, where is one of the uh, hot, hot, hot spots for COVID-19 uh, and sadly many, many deaths, Northern Italy, which includes Bergamo. Um, but let's go roll back to September, 2018 and just take a look at the testing. Now just watch the guys watching the testing. This is oil arm design number one. Oh. We didn't expect that to break then. It failed over the, the normal load, but below the design load. You know, you build in a, uh, a margin of, 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 uh, of safety in your structural design, um, but this didn't quite meet the margin of safety. So they had to go back and redesign the foil arms. Um, and run tests over again. So here we'll just watch how this uh, how this played out. A full testing program. So now we're May 2019. So now we're going to test design to number two because it will provide a full confidence to the designer, to the builders, and to the sailors in order to be able to push 100% from day one. After the first generation of the one design, we have gone through a full review. So we have uh, uh, changed the way we are building it. Uh, we, are, we have changed the way we analyze it uh, in order for the designers and the builders to make sure that we accomplish successfully this, uh, this milestone. These ACP 25 uh, are absolutely extreme machines. Uh, they develop and they deploy a huge amount of loads. If you imagine, usually a normal car weighs around uh, a thousand kilograms. Uh, here we are uh, uh, testing this board uh, with the equivalent of 20 cars. So we have uh, 20,000 kilograms applied uh, to the connection of this arm. And this arm is attached inside the boat uh, in a space that is uh, just a 600 millimeters, so 0.6 of a meter. In 0.6 of a meter, this arm needs to react and withstand uh, the equipment load of 20 cars. So with the starboard and port torsion. This kind of has never been done ever before. That's the first time we introduced this new kind of architecture. We want to make sure it works. It's not very often that you, that you get the opportunity to test something to this level, have this amount of information available. Um, but there's also the uncertainty of you're putting something into a test rig that's never been tested before. 
and you never know what can go wrong. Three tones, four tones. It has to be light in order to take off and foil early enough in light wind. We can't afford to produce some elements that are absolutely, you know, so bulletproof that they will be too heavy and do not allow us to foil. 13 tons. Uh, this is a very big deal that this goes right because it means the teams can move forward in confidence. We can go sailing, we can go ahead and get us, and we can, we can move on. This one is the last test. It's the one off, one way, no way back. Breaking uh, this arm uh, is going beyond the limit of the usual engineering uh, screening uh, that we usually do on components. Uh, so we are in a zone where uh, we will uh, be able to understand uh, the behavior of the structures over its service limits, over its extreme limits, up to the very end. So when we will uh, give the go and we will push the button, this cylinder of 35 tons will start to pull. There's no way back. 180% maximum working load, one minute fuel time counting. <laughs> We have some micro cracking happening on the way up, but way over the 2.1 times that was the expected minimum breaking. We need to still through, go through the, the surface of fracture, but it's a typical bending compression tension. And so the bottom line is, we're good to go. We're good to go. Yeah, we got an arm. Yeah. Looking forward to see. So there we go. That was the testing that was done. Now here's the two arms, um, generation one that broke, generation two that they, well, that broke as well, but at the uh, planned limit. So uh, I've added some little, you know, arrows and explanations to this, that the right end of these, there's a sort of yellow green fitting on it. That's actually the, a spigot that will be part of that's the attachment piece where the team that the teams have to design to attach their foil wings to the end of these arms um, remember that or maybe maybe it's not remember but know that um, unlike the ac 72s in san francisco unlike the ac 50s in uh, bermuda the foil arms don't get raked. They, the, the angle of rake doesn't change, only the cant, the up and down of them in and out of the water changes. The lift is varied by, change, by having movable flaps on the wings. We'll see wings in a minute. But this is, the, this is the part that just basically has to be driven up and down uh, when they're doing their maneuvers. Um, here's what the the thing actually is something like a glue lamb, uh, the, the design that actually worked. So here's, you know, basically here's just a picture of a glue lamb. And here's a, a diagram of the two designs of the original uh, generation one that broke at a much lower load level than they expected. Uh, it had two hollow members that were uh, assembled together the right side of the, of the diagram in both cases is a non-structural leading edge that's part of the supplied equipment, but that's, um, that's part of the, the supplied equipment. The teams are not allowed to do anything with that. Uh, the colored bars in the middle of the generation two, um, let's see, the going from left to right, the purple, red, blue, green, light blue, and sort of salmon color are all solid. And then you can see there's a place where the others have been drilled out to lighten them. Um, the left-hand edge of these, of, of these foil arms is actually left open for a fairing that the teams design and the teams add. And through that fairing run all of the control lines, uh, hydraulic, tubes and so on to operate the foil wings, which are at, out at the end of the arm. So the teams aren't allowed to do anything to these arms except to attach their own wing at the end, at the outboard end, and to attach their own fairing and their control systems on the trailing edge of the foil arm itself. Here's what the arm looked like after that test. Um, this is the sort of glue lamb structure of what they call end grain uh, carbon fiber. So think of uh, each one of these elements, I'll go back to here. Think of each one of these colored elements as like the, the 
the pieces of lumber that are glued together in a glue lamb. The, then after they made this, they wrapped it um, around, they wrapped a, a layers of, uh, of carbon fiber around it. So that gave it both the, um, the torsional, then the, that, that gave it the torsional strength. These um, end grain carbon fiber elements that are glued together like a glue lamb are what gives it the, uh, the longitudinal strength. So that's what it looks like when it's, uh, when it's, when the sucker is broken. Um, and then what goes out at the end of these arms? Because we put them on the boats. So here's, uh, we'll take a look at the different wings. And these are from boat one, obviously, of each of the teams, because no, no team has launched its boat two yet. Um, the arms are all the same. They're all the one design arms. The wings are the team's own design. Uh, the Kiwis have interesting to lots of people is that the Kiwis wings have the longest span and they don't have any um, bullet or fillet at the place where the wing attaches to the arm. So let's take a look at Lunarosa. You can see these bulbs that they have at the point where the wings attach to the end of the arm. You know, you go back and look at the Kiwi and there's a little bit of a trailing bulb there, but nothing as big as what Lunarosa has on theirs. And the uh, the right side of the, the left side of the picture is the, is the bow of the boat. So this is the sort of leading uh, edge of the, of the wing for Lunarosa's design. Compare that to the Kiwis where there's nothing coming forward of the, of the wing. Um, here's Ineos there sort of in between the two. They've got anhedral on the wings, meaning that the wings are sort of, are, um, if you think of the, the, the bulb there as like the fuselage of the airplane, uh, anhedral means that the wings are pointed down, um, span along the length of their span. And um, American Magic here with theirs, you can actually, here you can actually see the flap at the trailing edge of the wings. It's the sort of white stripe there. You can see it on the uh, on the inboard wing on this foil arm, which is obviously lifted. This is the windward arm. Um, an interesting thing to take a look at in this picture too is this is boat one. Um, American Magic, <laughs> American Magic, unfortunately got, got fooled. When they, uh, they wanted to get their test boat in the water as quickly as possible. So they, according to them, didn't spend a whole lot of time um, on their hull design. They wanted to have their boat one hull ready to go on April 1st, 2019, when they would be allowed to launch. Well, unfortunately, the arms failed that test. The arms weren't uh, correctly tested until May of, you know, so th two months after the launch date, they finally got the arms tested. They didn't get the, uh, the arms and the foil can system until August to be able to actually launch their AC-75. So their plan uh, to get their test boat in the water quickly uh, came to naught because of the problems with the, uh, the structural problems of the wings. One other detail, just I won't go into the main soul in this uh, in this talk, in this presentation, but you may know that the mainsail is a double skinned mainsail. Um, in, this is clearly, uh, you know, er, early in the development cycle because uh, you can see under the boom that the, the mainsail is not end plated to the, to the deck of the boat. Um, they, American Magic, no doubt will have, you know, complete end plating and close that empty space off in, on boat two and with their later design. But the, the mainsail is two skins, independently controlled. There are control systems in the bottom four meter, in the bottom meter and a half in the top four meters of the, um, uh, of the mainsail. So, um, they won, Team New Zealand was very critical of the wings as being very unwieldy and hard to, you have to crane them, you know, crane them off the boat every day. Uh, so they came up with something uh, at least as complex as the wing and not uh, as efficient 
But uh, again, the, the double skin mainsail seems to be working reasonably well on the yachts. We'll see how they do when we get into racing. Um, but that's the, uh, that's the look of the boats up until now. Um, racing, when will we finally get to see racing? Cagliari was supposed to happen in April. That was canceled, of course, because of the COVID-19 crisis. Portsmouth was supposed to happen in June. That was likewise canceled. The only America's Cup World Series that's still in the calendar is in Auckland in December. Uh, we'll see whether that happens. I certainly hope that it does. We'd love to see these boats racing, but we haven't been able to see them racing yet. Um, Ron talked a little bit in the introduction about uh, my, uh, um, my adventure in Valencia with, uh, with the Shoshaloza team, the South African team. Um, here's, the, uh, here's, the Afri here's the African queen uh, on the water in Valencia. That's not with the St. Francis Yacht Club Commodore's crews aboard that particular day. That's the bow of the, uh, of the IACC yacht, Shoshaloza, the race yacht there in, in black in, in front of the African queen. But I would say that there's a good chance that we'll be able to go to um, Auckland in March for the America's Cup match. Be a wonderful opportunity for another Commodore's cruise to come to Auckland and I'd be, uh, be happy to help with uh, some organization because I've got really good contacts with the people in, in Auckland for uh, doing things on the water uh, and on land, by the way. But um, our 36th America's Cup in Auckland, as uh, former Secretary of Defense Donald yeah. Rumsfeld used to talk about <laughs> known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Here's a couple of known unknowns. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, will the whole thing get postponed? We certainly hope not. They're on track to you know, maintain the dates, but that's a known unknown. Will there be a postponement? Let's hope not. Another known unknown, what are the racing rules of sailing America's Cup edition going to look like this time around? We would have known that uh, had there been racing in Cagliari, but we still don't know. They, at least it's not been posted on the notice board, the official notice board for the America's Cup. Um, remember that with the catamarans, with the AC-72s, and then with the AC-50s, we had blast reach starts, right? Um, this time we've been told we're absolutely going to have upwind starts, but we don't know what the rules will be about when you have to have your foils up and down. And uh, the, the rules could include uh, limitations, like maybe you have to have both foils down in the pre-start. We don't know. That hasn't been published. What will be the rule for mark rounding? Mark, uh, rule 18 was dramatically different in the America's Cup version of the rules and in the rules that they use in Sail GP compared to what we're used to because the America's Cup edition of the uh, mark rounding rules uh, were that it didn't, it doesn't, it didn't matter. I don't know what it will be for this time around, but it didn't matter uh, who got to the zone first. It didn't matter um, who was on port and who was on starboard. It didn't matter if somebody had to complete attack to make to round uh, the windward mark. All that mattered was, was there an overlap when the first yacht got to the zone? And if that was the case, then the inside yacht automatically had, had rights. Um, it makes things a little bit uh, complicated and surprising from time to time. Uh, another, but we don't know what the rules will be this time around yet. At least I don't. They haven't been published. I, I hope the teams maybe know them. Maybe Richard Slater, uh, our chief umpire, knows them. Uh, live line, Stan Honey, you know, a stalwart and well-known member of St. Francis Yacht Club, developed the live line augmented reality system that would paint those lines on the water and show us all the statistics of the racing. But guess what? You, you may know that LiveLine was also the umpiring system. And it was precise enough that it was used for all of the umpiring. But the Kiwis, of course, don't have LiveLine because LiveLine was, was funded by Oracle and, uh, and belongs 
uh, not to the Kiwi. So they're coming up with their own replacement for it. How well that will that work? That would be interesting. And then another question is, how good will the racing be? Uh, Marcelo Botin, the head of the design team for American Magic, has said, um, and you know, has said publicly, has been quoted, these boats are going to be really fast. I have no idea of whether they're going to be any good for racing. So <laughs> that remains to be seen. What will the racing look like in these yachts? Uh, and of course, who's hot and who's not? Well, we won't have even a, a kind of an inkling of that until the boats line up uh, in Auckland uh, in the fall and probably start to have a few brushes with each other and then uh, race for the first time in the America's Cup uh, World Series in Auckland in December. The, um, I guess it's probably worth pointing out that we have three challengers officially on the America's Cup website. There's a, a second American challenger, Stars and Stripes, that has uh, not paid the fees, has not ordered foil arms, has not completed building their boat, doesn't seem to have a sailing team, but they're still listed. Uh, I don't think much of anybody believes there will be anything more than three challengers, the ones that we have, Ineos Team UK with Ben Ainsley, uh, Terry Hutchinson leading um, American Magic with Dean Barker on the helm, uh, and the Lunarosa team with uh, Keko Bruni and Jimmy Spittle as the, the two potential helmsmen for that. So we'll see that racing get going in, in uh, December in Auckland. Um, there will be a Prada Cup, not Louis Vuitton Cup, but a Prada Cup for the Challenger Selection Series running in January with Round Robin and February for the finals they'll basically run a round robin to eliminate one team and the two remaining teams will sail the Prada cup final the winner of which will be the challenger who will go in challenger with a capital c who will go into the match with a capital m against the defenders the kiwis beginning on march 6th thanks very much for your attention uh, I'd, uh, I wish I were there so somebody could buy me a beer, but uh, that'll wait for another day and I'll be back to the club uh, when it gets reopened and I get uh, back to San Francisco for a visit. So thanks very much. <laughs> so uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, performance thus far of the boats. What do you think, what's minimum wind speed to get the boats foiling right now with these big 75 monohulls with a foil? Yeah, good question. Good question. And that again was, that's, uh, that illustrates a, a part of, oh, so first of all, six knots is the bottom wind limit for the racing. That's been established. They were, it took a long time for them to actually publish the race conditions and the wind limits, but the, the wind conditions will be six to 25 knots in the match and six to 21 knots in the uh, product cup. Um, in the round robin. So theoretically, you want to be able to get up on the foils in six knots of wind. You know, will they be able to do that? That would be interesting to see. Do you, when you're getting ready for the pre-start before the preparatory signal, when you are not yet sailing, right, um, you're allowed to use means of propulsion other than uh, you know, the wind and the waves. So you could be still on a tie line, a tow line, until just before the preparatory signal, drop the tow line when you're already up on the foils and then just try to not drop off of those foils before the race starts. Okay. Again, let's see the racing rules of sailing. Let's see what happens. But six knots is theoretically the speed at which these things should be foiling because that's what they've picked as the lower end of the wind speed. Are boats uh, jiving on foils? Are they able to keep up on the foils during jibes and tacks now? They, they, they claim that they can. There's some video footage that you can see when you, you know, go around on, you know, the, even the team's own websites, they'll show little clips, but rarely do you see a complete maneuver. Um, and, it, you know, let's, let's, see, let's see how they do. It seems like they can certainly foil jibe. Um, their foil tacks have been claimed. Do them consistently, do, it, do them in the middle of racing. Um, what sea state conditions can you do that in? 
it'll be interesting to see. I mean, you know, I, I think it's going to be, it's a hugely exciting and interesting America's Cup because it is so different from any yachts that we've ever had before. Who are the other cup uh, scribes that you like? Talk to us about who else is, is keeping track of what's going on in the cup in your game. Oh, sure. Well, you know, you very wisely have one of my favorite people next week, which is Steve Tsushia, uh, who's the, uh, you know, Steve is the chairman of the America's Cup Hall of Fame Selection Committee. I'm very happy to work with Steve on that committee. Uh, you know, he's great. Um, you know, PJ Montgomery is, is great, but he does, you know, he's more the announcer and he, you know, doesn't, he doesn't actually follow all of the details, you know, bit by bit, but he knows the America's Cup. Um, Richard Gladwell is good, but Richard is very, um, you know, he, who can blame him? You know, he's a, he's a Kiwi and he uh, is a, a big fan of, of what they, what they do, but he is, he takes a lot of really great photos. So he's a good photographer as well. And he gets a lot of, uh, of access to Team New Zealand and gets a lot of stuff. Um, I love what uh, Shirley Robertson has been doing with her podcast. You know, she did a, a great two podcast series where she interviewed um, all four of the heads of design. So Dan Bernasconi at Team New Zealand, uh, Marcelo Botan at, uh, at American Magic, Nick Holroyd at um, uh, Ineos Team UK, and Martin Fisher uh, at uh, Luna Rosa. Uh, she did a great job of interviewing them, and uh, her producer, Tim Butt, did an amazing job of cutting and pasting the snippets of, you know, they, that was four interviews, but basically they turned it into the final podcast was, now we're going to talk about hulls. Now we're going to talk about the mainsails. Now we're going to talk about the wings. Now we're going to talk about the control systems. And it was incredibly well done. So that double podcast from Shirley Robertson is really worth listening to if for people who are uh, geeky like I am about the engineering and the details because it's with all four of the heads of design. So there you go. Well, there's, there's, there's some really, really good people whom I love. Bob Fisher, of course, is a, is a great, you know, sailing journalist. Um, you know, there's a, there's, it's a wonderful community of people who are involved in it and following it. Wonderful. Well, Jack, thank you very much for being a guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Uh, we very much enjoyed your remarks and look forward to talking to you again as we get up to the cup. With that, the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon is adjourned. Thanks very much. Thank you. You're quite welcome.